Super Mario 63. This is a game that needs absolutely no introduction. Whenever I see people online reminiscing about Flash games from their childhood, 63 is almost always mentioned. I'd go as far as to say it's likely the most popular Mario Flash game of all time. I've already covered the Super Mario Flash duology, and as I established in that video, there's a plethora of Mario Flash games out there. Some of them are loving fan works made with great care and passion for the series, but most of them are this. Super Mario 63 is a game I have a ton of memories with. I played it all the time as a kid, mostly just just making levels with the level editor, but I remember playing the story as well. And I figured with Super Mario's 35th anniversary celebration going on, what better time than now to take a look back at this iconic Flash fan game. Super Mario 63 was created by Runout, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and this game's development history is actually surprisingly well documented, and I feel like not many are aware of it. There's so much to unpack here that I could probably make an entire separate video about 63's development, but for now let's keep it brief. The game's origins can be traced all the way back to 2005 with Runout's very first Flash game, Super Mario Sunshine 64. This game basically feels like a very, very rough draft of the version we eventually got. The controls are much simpler and feel super janky, there are a lot less levels, the story is pretty different, and the level designer is very primitive. Later on, Runout decided to remake it as Super Mario Sunshine 128, with an absolutely beautiful looking logo, and this game was later renamed and became Super Mario 63. Runout released several betas while developing the game, which can be found on the Runout wiki, and these each have plenty of differences, but they were generally much closer to the final product. The completed version of the game was first released on June 27th, 2009, though it did receive a few minor updates afterwards. Today you can find the game officially on Newgrounds and Runout's website, but of course it's available practically everywhere at this point. Runout's site has an option to download the game as an EXE file, which will still be playable after the Flash shutdown and is how I primarily played it for this video. So as the title implies, Super Mario 63 is a 2D reimagining of Super Mario 64, but it brings many of its own ideas to the the table, as well as elements from other Mario games, most prominently Sunshine. It's sort of like a reverse 3D world, that's a 3D Mario game that plays like a 2D Mario game, whereas 63 is a 2D Mario game that plays like a 3D Mario game. One of the most apparent aspects in which 63 deviates from 64 is the story, and by that I mean the story is completely original. It seems pretty standard at first, but the stakes are really ramped up after the second Bowser fight, more on that later. Starting up a new file, Mario is heading to Peach's castle for a surprise party, and he goes through a tutorial level to get there, which does a great job introducing the player to the controls and game mechanics. But as soon as Mario arrives, Bowser launches an attack on the castle. With the help of Kamek, Bowser knocks Mario unconscious, kidnaps Peach, and destroys the Shine Sprite Orb, which scatters all the Shine Sprites across the levels and covers the world in darkness. Mario is awoken by a toad named Eddie, the only toad who didn't flee when Bowser attacked. They find a Shine Sprite lying on the ground, then put it back in the orb, which Eddie decides to stay and watch over. Now it's up to Mario to go through all the levels and retrieve the Shine Sprites. The cutscenes here are really well done. They remind me a lot of classic sprite animations from around this time, which makes sense since those were also often made in Flash. Mario's movement options are a lot more fleshed out compared to any official 2D Mario game, which complements the more open, 3D-inspired level design very well. It's mainly controlled through the arrow keys and the Z, X, and C keys, which I always found to be a very comfortable layout. The arrows are used for moving, jumping, crouching, and diving, Z is for reading signs, talking to toads, and the ground pound when used in midair, X is a spin attack, which is useful for attacking enemies and falling slowly, and C is for flood. The triple jump is here too, Mario jumps higher with each consecutive jump, and the greater height is often required to progress if you don't have Flood. I absolutely love how this game controls. Mario's moveset is so well developed and versatile, the physics and momentum feel very smooth, you have a lot of control in the air which makes platforming easier, and it's literally fun and satisfying just to move around, which is the sign of a really good Mario game. Major props to Runout for completely nailing the movement. It's a near perfect adaptation of how 64 and Sunshine would handle in 2D, and it has such a satisfying sense of flow to it. It. Also worth noting is that you can zoom the camera in and out by pressing the plus and minus keys, and my god, why isn't this a feature in more 2D platformers? Being able to control how much you see around you is so useful! 63's core gameplay is obviously very derivative of its big brother. There are a total of 64 shine sprites and 64 star coins to collect. The shine sprites work just like the stars or shines in most 3D Mario games. They are the main collectibles rewarded for completing missions and are required to access later worlds and progress the story. Star coins, however, similarly to how they are in the new Super Mario Bros. games are completely optional collectibles that unlock extras, mostly new tile sets for the level editor. Peach's Castle is the main hub world of 63, just like in 64, and it's a great one at that. It's a lot of fun to explore, there are tons of secret passageways to find, and as you collect more shines, the castle gradually gets brighter and more toads return. After jumping through a level's painting, 
you choose which shine to tackle, and each one has a unique objective. You may have to find the shine somewhere in the level, collect 8 red coins, collect 5 silver stars, find and beat a secret course, fight a boss, among other objectives. With the exception of the secret courses, the worlds are completely non-linear. You can usually explore and grab the shines in any order you want. Mario's health is divided into 8 slices, just like in 64, but it takes 5 yellow coins to restore 1 slice as opposed to just 1. However, this wasn't really an issue since coins are plentiful and blue coins restore 3 HP immediately. Now, one of the defining features of Super Mario 63 is Flood, taken straight from Super Mario Sunshine, and all three nozzles are here and accounted for. The hover nozzle allows you to platform more carefully, correct jumps, reach higher areas, even repel enemies, and it's extremely useful. Well, almost a little too useful. It kind of makes the game a bit too easy. Once you get the hover box in a level, y you pretty much win. But after the first Bowser fight, the rocket and turbo nozzles are introduced. These two are much more situational. There are a few shines centered around them, but they're never as essential as the hover nozzle. The turbo nozzle is actually much more useful underwater. It lets you traverse through water a lot faster than swimming, and you never have to worry about running out of water because... Well, uh, yeah. You can freely switch between the flood nozzles you've collected in a given level by pressing shift, which is amazing and absolutely should have been a feature in Sunshine, but I digress, just make sure to turn off sticky keys. Though, of course, flood has a limited water supply. Once it runs out, you can't use the nozzles unless you refill flood's water tank by picking up nozzle boxes, run hour proofed water bottles, or by simply going into water. The inclusion of Flood in this game was an amazing idea. The nozzles feel great to use in 2D, and it really makes 63 stand out from other 2D Mario games. And if that wasn't enough, 63 also has all three power-up caps from 64, as well as the standard invincibility star. The wing cap lets you fly after triple jumping or shooting out of a cannon, the vanish cap lets you pass through specific walls, and the metal cap lets you sink in water and become immune to fire and poison. There are even a few instances where you have to make use of two caps at once, which brings out a lot of really creative level design. As you could clearly see, this game has a really great selection of power-ups. They each have their purpose and feel very enjoyable to use. Super Mario 63's presentation is a complete mishmash of sprites and music taken from a bunch of different sources, but it oddly kinda works? Since everything is ripped from different games, the art styles definitely do clash sometimes. The visuals have aged poorly and are undeniably the weakest aspect of the game, but I genuinely think they have a certain charm to them. But I might just be saying that because I'm used to them since I played this game all the time as a kid. In fact, I played this game before Yoshi's Island, so whenever I play that game, I can't help but notice how many sprites I recognize from 63. As for the frame rate, it's displayed on screen at all times, and for me it always hovered around 30 FPS. The only time it really dips is in custom levels with a ton of items, but in the main campaign it was always solid. The soundtrack consists of music ripped directly from official Nintendo games, as well as a few fan remixes made by various Newgrounds artists, and they're all pretty nice choices. I really like the remixes used, especially the Bowser and Secret Course themes. Though the game does have some weird audio problems when using headphones, the audio randomly alternates between being louder in the left and right ear, and it's kinda irritating. I've seen a few other people mention this too, so I'm pretty sure it's not just my cheap garbage earbuds. Oh, and this game's writing is actually hilarious. The Toads have a lot of really funny dialogue, be it either intentionally clever humor or just random outdated internet references that make me go ha. There are quite a few grammatical errors and typos in the game. But honestly, those kinda just make it funnier in my opinion. My favorite as a kid was always this Toad who comes up with a moveset for himself in Super Smash Bros. Brawl. Seriously, why is Toad still not in Smash? It's not just the Toads either, the signs and shine sprite descriptions have a lot of humor injected into them too. Stuff like this really gives the game its own style and personality. Mario 63's levels share a name and many elements with their 3D counterparts, but they have a different layout and don't just feel like simple 2D demakes. And as much as I'd really love to talk about each and every one in depth and tell you how great they are, I'd rather not completely spoil your experience if by chance you've never played this game before, but I will go over a few notable ones. The first real level is, who would have thought, bob on Battlefield, with Battlefield being two words for some reason. It's got the familiar cannons, chain chomp gate, mountain with the big steelies, and the fight against King bob -Omb, but it has many of its own distinct elements too, like a cloud area where the wing cap is introduced, and a secret course like the ones in Sunshine. The rest of the levels follow a similar design philosophy, taking components from the 64 equivalent, mixing them around, and adding some new elements as well. Boo's Mansion is interestingly the only course that doesn't share a name with its corresponding 64 level, but it's still very obviously inspired by Big Boo's Haunt. The mansion is a lot of fun to traverse, and there's even a boss fight against King Boo in the basement. Wet Dry World is way better than the actual 64 level it's based on. 
That's about all I can say. Yeah, the three mini courses are fine, but they're so short that they end up being kind of forgettable. Lethal Lava Land is cool because it actually has a story of its own that develops as you play the level. There's a war going on between the Toads and the Bullies, it's never explained why, and you have to support the Toads by infiltrating the Bully base and defeating the Big Bully. Rainbow Ride is a really fun one. Unlike in 64 where you have to tediously wait around on the flying carpets, you can skip past a lot of them through clever use of Flood, which is really satisfying to do. The Bowser levels are linear obstacle courses courses just like 64s, with boss fights at the end that are, again, just like 64s, and they're a lot simpler thanks to being in 2D. It took a bit to get used to pressing down to grab Bowser's tail, but they're good fights. Oh, and also this happened. <laughs> So that's neat. As I mentioned earlier, after the second fight, the plot takes a pretty dramatic turn. Bowser acquires some uh, thing called the Orb of Power, which grants him the ability to summon a giant meteor, sorry, THE meteor of ultimate destruction that will destroy the entire world except for his castle thanks to some force field or something. Then he will become the supreme ruler of the world. Wow, uh, that escalated quickly. Mario narrowly escapes back to Peach's castle, and Bowser announces through telepathy or something that they only have two days to live until the meteor hits, and they can only survive if they join his side. So of course everyone freaks out, and by the way I really like the fact that this toad apparently went on a vacation to Bowser's castle, like that's just a normal thing they do. Later we learn that Bowser even fired Kamek and is planning to basically leave him to die despite all he's done for him. There's even a flashback to Yoshi's Island, like wow they really gave Kamek actual character development in this game. I'll be the first to admit that this plot is just just ridiculous, but I really appreciate that Runout decided to go out of their way to give this game much higher stakes than your typical Mario outing. Yeah, it's overdramatic, edgy, and kinda comes out of nowhere, but I wouldn't have it any other way. 63 took me around 6 hours to finish, and that was while 100%ing everything. You could beat it a lot faster. And in true Mario fashion, speedrunners can beat it in 6 minutes with only one shine using glitches. Yes, of course this game has an active speedrunning community, why wouldn't it? This game has an excellent amount of content though, it's pretty much the perfect length for what it is. Thankfully, it also has the exact same save file system as 64, which means that yes, of course I 100%ed this game twice, shut up, it's good. While going for completion, you'll want to be looking at the star map, which has nothing to do with constellations, and everything to do with checking how many shines and star coins you've collected in each level. The one problem with it though is that the categories for the secret stars are extremely vague. I mean, one of them is just three question marks, like gee that's helpful. While on the topic of the pause screen, here you can also quickly access the game's options, switch your flood nozzles, which is kinda pointless since you can just press shift but I appreciate the gesture, and exit the level or quit the game. Like I said earlier, the game is fairly easy, mostly thanks to the hover nozzle. There are a few challenging parts, but it never feels frustrating or unfair which is a good thing. It's very generous with respawns too. If you die, you just restart at the screen you were on. You even get to keep the red coins and silver stars you've collected thus far. In fact, there aren't even any game overs. If you die with zero lives, you just get kicked out of the painting and your lives counter gets reset back to four. And I would be but a fool if I didn't mention that you can unlock a playable Luigi by getting 32 star coins. L is in fact real, and he even jumps slightly higher than Mario, which is a nice touch. Though he does feel a bit unfinished. There are a few animations and voice clips that Luigi lacks where he just defaults back to Mario. And you can't enter the final level as him either, but it's still really, really cool that he's here regardless. By now you're probably tired of me praising this game, so let's get into some nitpicks. Possibly my biggest issue with the game is that with the Bowser levels, including the final one, you get booted back to the castle after getting the red coin shine, which actually wasn't the case in 64. So you effectively have to play through all the Bowser stages twice if you're going for 100%, and the final the final one is pretty long, so yeah, that's kinda dumb. But even then, it's only three levels. Some of the Castle Secret Shine entrances are too cryptic and hard to find, especially Jolly Roger Bay. How are you supposed to know that you could just jump through this wall? And the reward for getting all the star coins is lame, it's just a room full of 1-ups and coins, which is a bit pointless since you likely already have all the shines by that point. I think maybe they should have had Luigi as the completion bonus instead and made the 32 star coin door something else. Oh man, Super Mario 63's final stretch is just so cool. Here's a pro gamer tip for you. Before taking on the final Bowser level, pick up the flood nozzles in the castle. You get to keep them and it makes the level way easier. The first half of Bowser's castle is like a gauntlet where you have to go through four challenge rooms to get four keys. Then you keep climbing up and up and eventually reach the very top of the castle where you fight Bowser in a really easy fight where you just have to ground pound on his head. But surprise surprise, that was a robot decoy apparently and now Mario has to use a launch star 
Star to chase the real Bowser into space. This part is awesome. There are bullet bills and meteors flying at you from every direction, and there's some really tight, satisfying jumps. Once you reach the top of the tower, you encounter Bowser, at this point fully possessed by the Herb of Power, and he's got Petch. The actual final boss is a really fun and unique twist on the previous Bowser fights, thanks to the space gravity. After grabbing Bowser, you'll fly into the air and have to throw him at just the right time into one of the floating bombs. It's a very satisfying final boss. With Bowser defeated, Kamek shows up and explains that there's no way to stop the meteor at this point, so instead he uses his magic to reverse the force field so that only Bowser's castle is destroyed by the meteor. Kamek's about to safely carry Mario and Peach back to the castle, but suddenly... <laughs> This leads to an amazing sequence where you have to escape Bowser's castle as it is being destroyed by the meter of ultimate destruction. This... This is how you do a final level. It's such a fitting climax to the plot and is extremely satisfying to beat. Mario narrowly escapes, Bowser's castle is obliterated, the world is saved, everyone goes into the castle to have cake, and the credits roll. But wait, there's more, because after beating the game, you can use the cannon to reach the wing cap on the castle's roof to access the game's final challenge, the Edge of the Mushroom Kingdom. On Rana's YouTube channel, they said that they made this level specifically to address criticism that the game was too easy, and yeah, that definitely shows. You have to platform over metal grates with the vanish cap, precisely bounce off bumpties, and traverse through a fiery labyrinth with bullet bills chasing you. And it's definitely the most challenging part of the game. But just like the rest of the game, it becomes significantly easier once you get the hover nozzle. Overall, a very satisfying ending to an amazing story mode. And that's Super Mario 60 through- wait, 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 wait! We haven't even talked about, like, the entire reason I loved this game so much as a kid. That's right, I'm of course talking about the level editor. Just like with Super Mario Flash and its sequel, most of my time playing this game as a kid was spent here. I would spend hours and hours just making levels, it was always my favorite thing to do in the game. And revisiting it today, while it does have its flaws, it just might be the best Flash level designer I've ever used. It's very intuitive and easy to learn, but still manages to have a lot of depth to it. I mean, 8 year old me was able to figure it out, but I'm still learning new things about it to this day. Starting a level, you can choose the name, music, background, as well as stage length and height. These can all be changed at any time afterwards, which is nice. There are three level save slots to use, and you can also use codes for easy sharing. Everything here falls under two categories, tiles and items. Tiles are self-explanatory, they act as ground for your course, and there are a ton of them for you to use once you've unlocked them all. There are a few here that have special characteristics too, like breakable blocks, blocks that only appear when you hit a switch, lava tiles, and cannons. You can click and drag to place tiles quickly, which makes creating terrain a lot faster. Items consist of coins, power-ups, enemies, platforms, scenery, etc., and most of them have special properties you can adjust by bringing up a window when you click on them. You can choose platform speeds, directions, designs, wait times, even how long power-ups last. It goes very in-depth. I've also always loved the ability to place signs and write whatever you want on them. Another great thing about items is that they're not restricted to the grid. You can place them wherever you want, which adds a lot of room for creativity. Also, it's possible to import custom graphics and music into the editor using some sort of witchcraft. I have no idea how it works, but it's neat and can really make a level stand out. It's really fun to push the editor to its limits by spawning a ton of enemies or making spinners and platforms move at maximum speed. The most disappointing thing about the editor though is that you can't really make courses with multiple shines like the ones in the story mode. I mean, you can place multiple shines, but the game won't keep track of which ones you've collected. Also, with all the helpful keyboard shortcuts there are, the lack of an undo button is a little jarring and can lead to some annoyance. But still, overall, this level editor is fantastic. It has so many customizable options that allow you to get very in-depth with your creation, but it's still super accessible and easy to use. And if you want to check out some of the community's creations, there's a level portal you can access in-game. It may not seem like much, but the fact that this is here is amazing. You don't have to scour the internet for codes, you can just click on a level and BAM, it's there! Some of these custom levels made by the community are extremely well done, and if the main game was too easy for you, of course there's a ton of Kaizo levels here too. Man, I could literally make and play levels all day, there's just infinite fun to be had. The level designing community for this game is still active to this day, which just makes me really happy. It's just incredible to see that this game that I love so much is still very much alive after all these years. And that's Super Mario 63. Simply put, 
I absolutely love this game. It's a joy to control, the levels are incredibly fun and well designed, there's so much to explore, it's chock full of personality, and it has an amazing level editor that kept me coming back both as a kid and now as a slightly older kid. It holds up exceptionally well today for an 11 year old fan game, and the fact that everything besides the sprites and music was done by just two people and it was made in Flash is really impressive and makes me appreciate this game even more than I already did. It's an amazing game that positively nailed what it wanted to be. This is definitely just my stupid nostalgia talking, but if I'm being honest, I kinda like this game more than 64. Yeah, it has a lot less frustrating parts and it's just generally a more enjoyable time for me. It's the perfect mix of nostalgia and actually being a genuinely great game, and because of that, as well as everything else I've praised it for, it's undoubtedly my favorite Mario fan game, and easily one of my favorite Flash games of all time. You can really feel the passion the developers had. The game's definitely not perfect, but it didn't need to be, and thanks to its little quirks and imperfections, it just feels so authentic! It's the definition of a perfect fan game. It's a labor of love that faithfully captures the essence of the source material, but with a ton of new ideas that make it stand on its own. And thanks to that, Super Mario 63 defined both mine and countless others' childhoods. And this game's legacy has definitely not been forgotten. Now, this video has mostly been about the actual game itself, but Super Mario 63's community is just full of very passionate and dedicated people. And nowhere is that more apparent than through this. That's right, Super Mario 63 is getting a sequel. The beautifully titled Super Mario 127 started development around early 2020 as a full continuation and sequel of 63, except it's not being made by Runout, instead by a group of devoted, talented fans of the original game. Runout has officially approved of the project, meaning that this will be considered the official sequel to 63, and boy is it looking to live up to the hype. I was able to try out a demo version, and keep in mind that it's still very early in development, right now it's just a level editor and a few sample levels, but it's great so far. Super Mario 127 builds off the foundation of 63 and adds even more on top of it. The game looks and runs beautifully. There are a lot more custom, original sprites used when compared to 63, and they all look very nice. I also really like how Mario and Luigi's sprites are from Bowser inside story, succeeding how the originals were from Superstar Saga. There are new additions to Mario's moveset like wall jumping and sliding, and there's even a full two-player split-screen mode, which I didn't really get the chance to try out, but is a very neat addition. As for the level editor, oh man, it's good. Remember how I mentioned that 63's editor had a ton of customizable options? Yeah, well 127 takes that concept, runs with it, and completely blows it out of the water. It's ridiculously customizable, you can adjust everything, even down to the most minute details. You can even freely adjust the scale of literally every object, including Mario. There's also the fact that you can finally properly make levels with multiple shine sprites. You can even name them, write a description, make them any color you want, and choose whether or not they force you to exit the level. Another incredible new addition to the editor are layers, which let you make your levels a lot more pleasing to look at by creating background walls or stuff like that. Placing tiles is a lot quicker and simpler, you don't have to place the individual pieces of slopes and walls, instead you just place the tiles and the game does the work for you. This is genuinely the most fun I've had making Mario levels in years. This project is looking to be a very worthy successor, and I highly recommend giving it a look if you like 63. You can find links to all their stuff in the description. Anyway, that's about it for this video. Moral of the story is, if you haven't played Super Mario 63 before, or just haven't played it in a while, go fix that right now! It's a genuinely fantastic game that I think deserves more praise and recognition outside of just nostalgia posting. It's seriously just such a blast to play, and it- Oh! Uh, sounds like I just got some mail! Well, shit!